The reading today is from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 to 28, and it's found on page 1207 in the Church Bibles. The Holy Spirit clearly teaches from all these arrangements that the way into the most holy place has not yet been opened as long as the outer tent still stands. This is an illustration which points to the present time. It means that the offerings and animal sacrifices presented to God cannot make the worshipper's heart perfect, since they have to do only with food, drink, and various purification ceremonies. These are all outward rules which apply only until the time when God will establish the new order. But Christ has already come as the high priest of the good things that are already here. The tent in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It is not a man-made tent. That is, it's not a part of this created world. When Christ went through the tent and entered once and for all into the most holy place, he did not take the blood of goats and bulls to offer as a sacrifice. Rather, he took his own blood and obtained eternal salvation for us. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt calf are sprinkled on the people who are ritually unclean, and this purifies them by taking away their ritual impurity. Since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while the first covenant was in force. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it has died, for will means nothing while the person who made it is alive. It comes into effect only after his death. That is why even the first covenant came into effect only with the use of blood. First, Moses proclaimed to the people all the commandments as set forth in the law. Then he took the blood of bulls and goats, mixed it with water and sprinkled it on the book of the law and all the people, using a sprig of hyssop and some red wool. He said, this is the blood which seals the covenant that God has commanded you to obey. In the same way, Moses also sprinkled the blood on the tent and over all the things used in worship. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything is purified by blood and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way. But the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. For Christ did not go into a man-made holy place, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year with the blood of an animal. But Christ did not go in to offer himself many times, for then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Everyone must die once, and after that be judged by God. In the same manner, Christ also was offered in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Is that better? You can hear me now. Good morning. It's great to be here with you this morning, and it's wonderful to have uh, some visitors from 
uh, Brisbane and uh, unfortunately you've come to the cold of uh, Melbourne and uh, notice you've got the rugged up. We've also got some visitors from uh, Hobart and uh, welcome to Tasmania, Launceston. And so welcome to the beautiful, sunny, warm uh, surrounds of Melbourne. So it's, it's, it just shows you that uh, it's all about perspective, isn't it? So, you know, uh, we've actually been doing uh, a, a series, uh, we've been teaching through the book of Hebrews and I've, I've spoken about many of the themes of uh, Hebrews. Uh, we then took a break and did some other teaching on, on some other things and uh, we're, we're now going back into the book of Hebrews. And uh, there are times when we, we do a sermon and uh, we read a particular passage and there's probably about four or five different sermons in a particular passage. Sometimes I might even pick a particular one of those themes and we'll do a deep dive into to that theme. But this passage here, uh, the book of Hebrews is, is basically... A, a letter to uh, Christians who've come out of the, the, the Jewish faith. And, and this part of the, the book, the author is kind of saying, all of God's story from the very beginning to the very end, uh, you all know that story. And I'm just going to recap it for you. That's what the, the author is saying. So he's, he's done some uh, encouragement to them not to give up following Christ. And we've spoken about that. Uh, he's, he's done a whole lot of other things in this letter. And now in chapter 9, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a recap saying, you know all of these things. That's why we call it the letter to the Hebrews. Because they don't know the location where the letter was given. But there's so much assumption that the recipients of this letter know the story of God. Uh, that, that's why it gets the name, the Hebrews. They must have been people who knew the story of God in the Old Testament. Uh, so uh, the challenge for me this week is, is giving you the whole story of God in the next 20 minutes. So you up for it? We're ready to go? We're ready. So if we go back to, the, the and, and again, in, in the same way that the author to the Hebrews is probably saying, you already know this but I'm going to recap it for you. My, my hope is that some of us who've been following Jesus for a long time know this, but we can't ever forget or assume this. We have to be able to articulate it in order that the next generation are able to pick it up from us. What we assume, we don't pass on to the next generation. And I heard this week someone say, um, God doesn't have grandkids like, we, we, we are the people that need to pick up the faith. And, and the children that are around us, they're also God's children. We need to pass on the faith to them. We need to tell the story of God to them. We can't just assume it. So we, got, we actually have to start, not where Genesis starts, but where the Gospel of John starts. The Gospel of John starts with, actually, in the beginning was God. In the, uh, if you go back to the previous slide... If you, in the very beginning was God. And I think that particularly with some of the, the threads that the atheist movement are, are pushing in our world, we need to understand that from the beginning was Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. We, we, we have to understand fundamentally from the very beginning, Jesus always was. Jesus was part of creation because one of the atheist angles is that Jesus is an invention of uh, the early Christian church, or that he only came, he was a human being, he only came into existence at the beginning when we hear about Jesus in the Gospels. We've got to understand that Jesus always was. And so he, he is at the very beginning. We go to the next slide. We've got Jesus uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So before anything happens, we have the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, the Creator. And then we go to the book of Genesis, the next slide. We have um, God creates the heavens and the earth. So the story of God begins with God. It then goes to God's creation. And God is a creator. And God creates the heavens and the earth. Again, another important point. I, I did a whole sermon series on God the Creator. God sits above creation and rules and reigns over creation. 
God is not uh, uh, some kind of Mother Earth principle that we see in some uh, spiritualities. God sits over and above creation and, and God creates the heavens and the earth. And that'll become a theme as we unpack more about the story of God. But as God uh, is in existence and God creates the heavens and the earth, it's a good heaven and a good earth. There are two realms and, and, and I want you to, to know that God uh, starts with this but also as we'll get to the end of God's story, it returns to this theme of God being with us in heaven and earth as one, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. So, if we go to the next slide. So, God decided to dwell with His people. God wasn't just going to stay in the heavens, but God was going to dwell with God's people. And the reason that God wanted to dwell with His people was because He created His people to be in relationship with them. The, the, the people of God weren't just some kind of uh, other part of His creation. They were a special part where God was to have a relationship with His people. And so after, the, the, if we, we can't really tell you everything in the story of God in 20 minutes, but but we know that they were uh, slaves in Egypt, they get liberated from uh, slavery in Egypt and they start going through wandering in the desert and, and the Bible tells us that God's presence was with the people. I've spoken about this before, the presence of God was with the people and Moses says to God, God, we're not going to go anywhere where your presence isn't with us. God dwells with His people and as they travelled, it was a, a, God's presence was in the cloud by day and, and a pillar of fire at night. And then God tells the people to build what they call a tabernacle and the tabernacle is like a tent of meeting, a place where God will be with His people. And in the centre part of the, the tabernacle was a place where God was to dwell and then in uh, God's command, Solomon is commanded to build the temple. David builds the city, Solomon builds the temple. And when Solomon builds the temple, he builds it in such a way that God has a place to dwell. It's called the Holy of Holies or the Most High Place. And this was considered the highest point on the earth, not geographically. There are parts of, of Jerusalem that are uh, part of Israel that are higher than this part in Jerusalem but it's considered the high place, the most high place, this theme that we heard in the reading today, he entered the most high place. But Solomon builds the temple in such a way that God dwells in the temple. And that part there, that sort of tall part was considered the holy of holies, it was considered where God himself dwelt, it was considered to be heaven on earth. And from this place, God's blessing was to travel to the ends of the earth. But I spoke last week on the covenant and the covenant was meant to be a blessing for all people, but the people of God broke the covenant. The people of God didn't let the blessing of God go to the ends of the earth. In fact, the religious leaders said that all people had to come and visit this place and God was restricted by the people of God to this place rather than to be a blessing to the ends of the earth. And because the people had sinned and had broken the covenant, God withdraws His presence. And I think we've got the next slide. God withdraws His presence. And so this temple becomes a function of religiosity rather than the place that God dwells. And the first part of Hebrews chapter 9 talks about the sacrifice and the rituals that take place there, but they're kind of empty rituals because they're, they're, they're uh, functioning but God is actually not dwelling with His people anymore. And so God, as I said last week, God had always had a plan. We, we heard it in Jeremiah 31. God had a plan to restore a new covenant with His people. It wasn't something that the Christians invented post-resurrection. Uh, it wasn't something that Jesus invented when He came. No, God always had a plan to restore the covenant with His people and to create a new covenant where God would dwell with His people, but they would truly be a blessing to all the ends of the earth. And so God had a plan to bring a Messiah 
to usher in that new covenant. And I think on the next slide we have Jesus comes to be that Messiah to the world. Jesus comes as a blessing to the world. But God dwells with his people through the person of Jesus. As Jesus comes and lives on the earth, the incarnation, God dwells with his people through Jesus. Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine, but he gives up acting in his divinity in order that he can uh, accomplish his mission that he has been sent by the Father. Jesus is the representation of God's presence here on earth. And notice that the presence of God doesn't return to the Holy of Holies. The presence of God returns in a person of Jesus. And that'll be an important thing for us as we follow Jesus. And I spoke last week that we in the new covenant no longer have to be restricted to one place but we have the privilege of going out into the world and taking the presence of God with us because of Jesus and the new covenant. Jesus comes to usher in a new kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, and the people of God thought that Jesus was going, or the Messiah was going to come and kick the Romans out, restore God to his little box on earth, and everything would be how it was before. And Jesus comes to upend that, to bring a spiritual kingdom and to return to the covenant that God had promised in Jeremiah 31 and offer himself as a sacrifice on the cross to atone for sin. And Jesus atones for sacrifice on, uh, once and for all. And in Hebrews 9, we read that Jesus didn't have to re-sacrifice himself like the high priest in the temple did because the high priest in the temple was offering an insufficient sacrifice Jesus on the cross offers a one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Not just the people of Jesus' day, but all people of all time. And therefore, we don't have to sacrifice Jesus again. And notice in Hebrews 9, Jesus doesn't atone for his sin through blood of goats and sheep and cattle, but Jesus sacrifices his own blood. And it's through his blood that we are made clean. There's this phrase in the, in the Hebrews 9 there where it says, uh, it talks about a will. We know, don't we, if you've ever had a relative die, that um, they, they have a will and testimony while they're living, but it's not executed, it's not, it's not uh, functional until they pass away. Once they pass away, then the will and testimony can be lived out, it can be executed. And and that's the same with the covenant that Jesus brought in. He he, he came to usher in a a, a covenant that had been promised in the Old Testament. But it's not until the Messiah dies that that covenant can be brought into existence. It's not until he dies that the forgiveness of this atoning sacrifice on the cross comes into full effect. But likewise, it's not until he returns and is risen from the dead that the covenant is also uh, brought into fullness. Because it's through his resurrection that we are made right with God. As Paul says, if Jesus had never risen from the dead, then our faith would be in vain. And so after the resurrection... We have what we call the ascension. Jesus rises to return to heaven. And in Hebrews 9, 24 here, we read, Jesus entered into heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. The presence of God is is our key mission here at St. Columns. That's our key focus. Living in the presence of God is central to what we do. And the reason it's central to what we do is because that's what Jesus' blessing was and he goes into God's presence to advocate for us and to tell God about righteousness through him. I want you to hold on to that because that's going to be the focus of our prayer time today. But God didn't want to just withdraw to the heavens like he did in the Old Testament. God wanted to maintain his presence with us. 
And Jesus was God's presence and, and God wasn't going to return to a little box called the Holy of Holies in the temple. Because the blessing of God had to go to all the nations. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and I will be with you always. But he's gone to the heavens to sit at the right hand of the Father like we have in our stained glass behind me. So who is to come and be with us always? We started the story of God with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and this is where the Holy Spirit comes in to dwell with his people. And we've got the next slide. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in the world today. The Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son into the world to live with us. The day of Pentecost comes and the, 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 the mission of the church is, is fueled by the mission of the Holy Spirit. This frail group of human beings who are sitting in the upper room doubting what they have to do have a power that only comes when the Holy Spirit lives in them. And the power of the church today, this is where we live today. We've got more of the story of God, which I'll get to in a minute, but this is where we live today. We live in the time where God has, uh, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit has come to fuel us to make disciples of all the nations, teaching everybody to obey. And then if we go to the next slide. But Hebrews 9 tells us that Jesus will return. This is kind of like um, the whole point of the story. The whole point of the story is that Jesus will come and return. And just as at the beginning of creation, Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit bring in the new heavens and the earth, as Jesus returns, he's going to restore all things to himself. He's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. But let's get clear. The direction of this in the scriptures is not what we often think at a funeral. At a funeral, we say that somebody has gone up to heaven. But actually, the direction of the scriptures is that the heaven's going to come to earth, that God is going to bring a new heaven and a new earth down here, and that God will dwell with his people for all time, for all eternity, and that heaven and earth will be one, and God's presence will be everywhere. In fact, it won't just be a little box called the Holy of Holies, but the whole earth will be covered with, with God's presence because heaven and earth will be one. And that's such an important direction for us to have. This is the future hope that we have. This is the story that we have. And we particularly participate in the renewal of God's creation. This is, we're living in the now and not yet. We don't see the kingdom of God and, and the heavens and the earth fully realised yet. God's creation hasn't been restored as God intends it to be one day. But the renewal of God's creation, the ushering in of God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, is part of our mission today. So, so we shouldn't become a group of Christians that are in a holy huddle waiting for the day where we get to escape this world. We should be a group of people who are active in our world, seeing the restoration of all people and seeing the kingdom of God break into our world. The, the, the idea that people are talking about at the moment is there's a lot of talk in the church about revival and, and what's, what's happening as God does a new thing in the world. But one of the interesting things is that people are describing it as, as the gap between heaven and earth are, 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 is a thin place where revival takes place. Where, where the idea that God's kingdom is breaking into the world as it is in heaven, that gap becomes thinner and thinner when, when an outpouring of the Holy Spirit at revival happens. And so we pray for that day. We pray not for the day where we get to leave this earth and go to heaven to be with God in, in glory, but we pray that God's kingdom would come in and renew the earth and that creation would be restored. We pray for the day where Jesus will return and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and that the blessing of God that was written in the Old Testament where God would dwell with his people, that that would take place in our day and that we would see that. 
So this little bit is, is the future part of the story. We don't live in that yet. We live in the bit where the Holy Spirit has come. So, so the challenge really for the church today, probably a bit like the author of the Hebrews is saying, that's the story of God. That's the, the narrative of God. And you would know that. So, so why would you go back to that old bit when there's the future? When Jesus has come, why would you go back to the bit before the Messiah has come? And the challenge for us in the church today is, is given that we know that there's a future hope, why would we be dwelling in the past era of the church? Why would we be dwelling in the, the way that God has moved in the past, not be looking for how God is moving and will move in the future? And I think it's a challenge to holiness. See, holiness is sometimes portrayed as being set apart from the world in, a, in order to be a holy huddle. Or, or, or sometimes, as I said in the, the newsletter this week, sometimes holiness is portrayed as something that the professionals do, that, that, that church professionals do. Like Helena and I can be holy, but, but you mere mortals can't be holy. That's not what holiness is about. Holiness is actually, in Hebrews 9, it's centred on the person of Jesus. Jesus is in heaven advocating on our behalf. And so, therefore, our entrance into the presence of God is through Jesus. To, to be like Jesus, to follow Jesus, to act like Jesus... I think we've got the next slide. So as we wait for Jesus to return, we, we don't just uh, get on with the mission. We actually desire to behave more like Jesus, to think more like Jesus, to see the world like Jesus. And Jesus cared for the poor, cared for the marginalised. And are they the people that we care for? Are they the people, do we see the world as Jesus sees it? So it's not just personal behavior modification but it's actually starting to see the world as Jesus saw it which is the creation that he made which is good and uh, worth being a part of and worth saving rather than fleeing from or that somehow we're morally superior and the rest of the world is bad and so therefore let's separate from it the, the, the next slide as I was reading uh, J.I. Packer, um, I was reading it in a commentary. This is a quote from a commentary, but it's in J.I. Packer's Rediscovering Holiness. Genuine holiness is genuine Christ-likeness. So, the desire for holiness, this sort of idea that it's professionals who are holy, we need to get away from that. You're not copying me, you're not copying Helena, we're all copying Christ. To be holy is to be Christ-like. And to be Christ-like is to be genuinely human. So if we want to live out our full humanity, then we need to be like Christ. As J.O. Packer says, this is the only genuine humanness that there is. Love of the service of God and of others. Humility, meekness under the divine hand. Integrity of behaviour expressing integration of character, wisdom with faithfulness, boldness of prayerfulness, sorrow at people's sin, joy at the Father's goodness, single-mindedness in seeking to please the Father, morning, noon and night are all qualities that we see in Christ. That's what we're called to. And you, you might say to me, You might say to me, Mark, I could never achieve that. But you know, when we fall short of that, that's where grace and mercy comes in. You see, God doesn't say, act like that and then I'll let you enter into heaven. I'll let you enter into my presence. No, Jesus goes into heaven and advocates on our behalf and extends grace and mercy so that when we don't act like that, 
It's not our righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Christ. You see, the great, the great joy of understanding the whole of the story of God is we know that there's a future for us. And it's actually that future that draws us forward into the world rather than retreating from the world. So as we at St. Columns think about living in the presence of God, it's, it's a genuine humanness. It's, it's a genuine Christ-likeness. It's a genuine delight. Holiness should be a whole lot of fun. In our prayer time, we'll, we'll get to it, but I'm going to encourage us to, to pray for, for the things that are stopping us from being holy as Jesus is calling us to be holy. But I, but I really want us, as, as, we, as we hear the stories about uh, hundreds and hundreds of Gen Z who are finding freedom of repentance in the grace and mercy of Jesus through the, the various revivals that are taking place around the world. What we're hearing is that there's a freedom rather than a guilt and shame. They're actually being liberated from guilt and shame, not burdened by guilt and shame. So as we think of a desire for holiness, it should be a lightness, not a heaviness. It should be a freedom, not a burden. It should be a joy and a delight rather than guilt and shame. So when we come to that in our service, and I'll lead us through that when we get there, I encourage us to see it as a great joy to be holy as Jesus is holy.